Hello. Mm -hmm. oh, so welcome. My name is Jim Matulski and I'm the co-president of the Peninsula Multi-Faith Coalition. And welcome to our discussion of March, volume one, uh, a graphic novel by John Lewis, the late John Lewis. Uh, there's some housekeeping things we want to say before we begin, before I introduce our principal uh, facilitator and guest, uh, guest speakers. Um, but uh, be sure to take the poll if you have the opportunity before uh, when you check in. And if you wanna say hello in the chat and what group you're from or what faith house you're from, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I, I see lots of uh, people from various faith houses here. We have a great multi-faith gathering. Um, so uh, I'll model it by putting, hi, this is Jim from Island United Church in the chat in a moment. But uh, so welcome, we're glad that you're here. And there's just, as I said, a few housekeeping things we wanna do. This is a no shame book discussion. What do I mean by that? It's okay if you haven't actually fully read the book or haven't even read half of it, or maybe you just have it and haven't read it yet, or maybe you wanna get a copy of it, but you haven't had a chance to yet. We have copies available, which we're happy to make available to you. This is a book discussion about the book, uh, so it's okay if you haven't read it. Don't feel ashamed, don't feel embarrassed. This is uh, for people who are interested in John Lewis and in this book. So if you still wanna get a copy of the book afterwards, uh, uh, make sure that we get your email address and so that we can follow up with you about it. Uh, this is an event co-sponsored by with the NAACP, San Mateo Branch, uh, and the Peninsula Multi-Faith Coalition. We're so excited to be doing this as a, a co-sponsored event. Uh, we're proud to have a relationship with the San Mateo Branch of the NAACP. We consider this a strategic partnership uh, with the Multi-Faith Coalition. And uh, I wanna recognize that uh, we have the president, Reverend Lori Carter Owen, who is here tonight, and she'll be uh, commenting on uh, the book and why John Lewis's memory is so important. And we also have two vice presidents uh, here with us, uh, Catherine Haybert, Haysbert and uh, uh, Alexa Lewis, Alexis Lewis. Uh, so we are so glad to have them here as well and any other members who might be with us. Um, the, uh, this is uh, made possible with, by a generous grant from the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. So, and that's who's made the books available to us for free. If you know a young person who wants, you wanna give this book to, we're also happy to give you a copy of it. So uh, be sure to contact us and we'll make sure you get a copy of the book either for yourself or for somebody else. Um, we are happy to make them available and we are grateful to the Silicon Valley Foundation for this. Um, as I mentioned, our two guest hosts um, are uh, Reverend Lori from the San Mateo branch of the NAACP. Reverend Lori has done a number of things with us, including was a keynote speaker for us on Martin Luther King Day of Service earlier this year, and as a distinguished civil rights leader and uh, pastor in Oakland as well. So we welcome Reverend Lori. And then uh, Dr. LaShawn Daly comes to us. Uh, you know, as some of you know, I used to be a librarian and I tapped my network of librarians and uh, they said, my friends at the Jewish Community Library in San Francisco said, you've got to get Dr. Daly. She is so smart about, uh, about the kinds of things that you're trying to do tonight, which is introduce not only an important text, March by John Lewis, to a group of people who might not have read uh, the book before, but in a genre that might be unfamiliar. Now, maybe many of us have not previously read um, uh, a graphic novel before. And Dr. Daly's scholarship is all about the importance of picture and text and communicating uh, to new generations, uh, important information. Uh, she's herself a writer and has a, a great children's book, which I uh, was able to locate called Mr. Oprah, a, uh, about a, a vegetable seller in New Orleans. I recommend it to you, uh, to readers of all generations. She's a graduate of UC Berkeley, a PhD graduate, and uh, is an instructor uh, uh, teaching teachers, really, uh, and graduate students at UC Berkeley and at UC San Diego. So uh, we are so delighted to have her with us tonight and to have her help us understand how to really appreciate 
a book like March, not only for its content, but its form as well. So thank you, Dr. Daly, for being with us. Uh, and we'll have, uh, we'll put in the, uh, uh, in the chat her website so you can follow up with her if you'd like uh, and find out more about her work and her scholarship. Uh, and we'll also put in the chat uh, the website for the NAACP Cemetery chapter. Um, other housekeeping material uh, information, uh, you're welcome to use the chat. Um, I'm not sure that there's that much else I want to say before we just really launch in and begin. So I hope you enjoy tonight and uh, that you leave here with a deepened appreciation uh, for John Lewis and also an interest in our further activities this summer that we're doing to commemorate John Lewis and his legacy, including a movie night at the Latter-day Saint Church in Foster City on July 24th, uh, showing a documentary film about John Lewis called Good Trouble, and uh, uh, an event we're doing on Sunday, August 15th in the afternoon at Central Park in Redwood, C uh, not Redwood City, in San Mateo, uh, a march for racial justice in the spirit of John Lewis, sort of asking what would John Lewis uh, inspire us to be active about today. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, invite us to watch this brief film, about two minutes, um, that depicts John Lewis receiving a recognition, a National Book Award, for uh, this book, uh, the first volume of the book, uh, March, uh, because it shows what this book, writing this book and the recognition it received meant to him. Thank you. Thank you. This is unreal. This is unbelievable. Some of you know I grew up in rural Alabama, very, very poor. Very few books in our home. And I remember in 1956, when I was 16 years old, with some of my brothers and sisters and cousins going down to the public library, trying to get library cards. And we were told that the library was for whites only and not for colors. And to come here and receive this award, this honor with this, it's too much. Thank you. But I had a wonderful teacher in elementary school who told me, read my child, read. And I tried to read everything. I love books. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Nate. And thank each and every one of you. And thank all of the judges. Thank you, National Book Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so grateful that we got an opportunity to watch this really monumental moment and now to be able to dive into the book itself. Uh, my name is LaShawn, or you can call me Dr. Daly, and I'm excited for tonight's discussion. Uh, just wanting to be engaged with not only the text, but also the work that all of you are doing in your communities. 
So in regards to tonight's discussion, I definitely want to look into some kind of key themes and some literary frameworks that are significant in this text. And I also look forward to hearing your insights into this text as well during the Q&A portion um, towards the end of our time together. And definitely feel free to be in the chat, especially as I'm going through some of the pages and reading through some of the pages for anything that feels really significant for you. And so for those of you who have not had the opportunity to read the book just yet, I think it's important for you to know that book one is the first book of the graphic novel trilogy created by Congressman Lewis. Uh, this book was published in 2013 and of course, as you can see, it went on to win numerous awards. And so some of the main scenes from this book takes place in and around 1963 and the growth of the civil rights movement. Yet it also flashes back to Lewis's childhood and he also mentioned that in the speech. Um, so in the 1940s and 1950s as John Lewis was growing up, we have these images and the narrative of his childhood. And the text also flashes forward to January 20th, 2009, where we have the opportunity to watch Congressman Lewis prepare for the inauguration of our former US President Barack Obama. And so the graphic novel, for those of you who aren't familiar with graphic novels, um, it pairs illustrations and text to form this kind of comic-esque aesthetic. Um, uh, graphic novels are also known as comics depending on the, the part of the industry that you're referring to. Um, but most people will consider this a graphic novel. And so of course it's very popular with the youth in the US and also some adults, but graphic novels are also extremely popular in Asian countries and Asian communities um, because it just has a larger following. So while we're also just kind of recognizing that this trend has been popular in other spaces, even though uh, the, the genre and the aesthetic is becoming more popular in the US. And um, so actually before I get into more of the kind of themes and the book aesthetics, I do wanna start off by um, inviting Reverend Owens to kind of speak into how do we continue to honor Congressman's legacy, um, especially with the work that we're all doing in our communities locally and perhaps even globally. And how do we like really understand how this book is influential and how it's timeless in a time where we're all heightened um, and wanting more information on how to do the kind of work that he did and how to move that legacy forward. So uh, Reverend Owens, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, bring you all greetings from the San Mateo branch of the NAACP. And I wanna just start by talking about uh, or mentioning the NAACP's mission, which is to ensure the political, educational, social, economic equality and rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And if there is you know, a person that I can think of and that personifies what is in essence the mission of the NAACP, it is John Lewis. He, uh, he started early. It wasn't like he had years and years and years of epiphany to come to the realization that he was called for such a time as this, that he was here on this earth uh, and his, his, he was chosen, if you will, to move forth this legacy, to move forth this mission of trying to win equality for all people. He started very, very early in his life. He became a disciple of nonviolent approaches to uh, trying to fight the discrimination that is so embedded in this country. And he dedicated his life to it. He dedicated his body to it. He was beaten and he was um, harassed and, and he went through so much, uh, but he never wavered. And I think that that is something that um, in, in our days, in our time now, it's easy to get tired when we look at what's going on in our society. We look at the attacks on people of color. We look at the police brutality uh, against uh, 
unarmed people of color. We look at the violence against Asian Americans. We look at the attacks on the LGBTQ community and, and all the uh, advances that have been won there that are being threatened. We look at the threat of voting uh, against voting rights. And we look at um, the attacks on the truth being told about the United States of America and what our true legacy is, the good and the bad. Uh, we we want to focus, you know, under the color of patriotism on the good, but we don't want to talk about the violence. We don't want to talk about the abuse. And so it's easier now to say, oh, well, you know, we don't want critical race theory taught in our schools because it's racist instead of saying, look, it's time for us to face the, the true complexity of this great nation and to heal the wounds instead of trying to cover them up. John Lewis was a person who believed in looking at the truth. He looked at it through the lens of nonviolence. He looked at it from not from the standpoint of trying to blame people or make people feel guilty or to try to uh, elicit violence against someone else. He looked at it from the standpoint of we are all Americans. These are wrongs that need to be righted. And he gave his all. So I think that it's, it's important because when we are so many years after what was officially the civil rights era, looking at how we backtracked, we backtracked. You know, a lot of people felt, oh, we've had a black president, but to be, be honest, I believe, and this is just Reverend Lori talking, that was the beginning of the backtracking because I think a lot of people were content to kind of just keep things the way they are, but the specter of a black man in the White House really brought out a lot in people. And we are seeing active attacks against people of color and an LGBTQ community, the anti-Semitism that we see. All of this is just really, really um, taking place. I mean, it's always been there, but it's like the, the scab has been pulled off. And a lot of us are just like, oh, we don't want to have to go through this again. We're tired. But we look at the tireless tirelessness of John Lewis. And that should be inspiration to us that we have to keep moving forward. We have to keep fighting in a spirit of nonviolence. We can't go and, and, and talk about violent revolution or anything like that. We have to continue in that spirit. So it's important to study his life. It's important to study his methods. And it's important to continue his work. So I am very honored to, be, to come alongside you all tonight to look at the life and, and look at the experiences of John Lewis and ask the questions, what can we do to continue this work? So thank you so much. Thank you for facilitating Dr. Daly. I'm looking forward to spending the rest of this uh, time and listening to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And with that, let's dive into the book. So I'm going to read a couple of passages and that way we can just kind of see and begin to explore um, some of the experiences that John Lewis had, but also the power in the book uh, inside the text and in the illustrations. And we'll also have the images for you shared on the screen. If you do have a copy of the book available, I will be reading um, the first couple of pages uh, pages 20 to 28, and I'll give you a moment, um, Diane, to get those images up on the screen. Um, again, I'll be reading this, these uh, first section, pages 20 through 28. I'm gonna start at the bottom of page 20. As a child, my parents gave me the responsibility of taking care of our family's chickens. We lived on 110 acres of cotton, corn and peanut fields in a little corner of Pike County, Alabama. My father bought it in the spring of 1940 for $300 cash. It was every penny my father had to his name, money earned by tenant farming. My father was a sharecropper. I never had any feelings about the other animals on our farm. 
but I was always drawn to the chickens. I never took the chickens straight to the yard to feed them. I felt the need to talk to them first. Chick, 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 chickies. Chick, 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 chickies. No one else could tell those chickens apart and no one cared to. There were Rhode Island Reds, Dominiques and Bantans. I knew every one of them by appearance and personality. They were each individuals to me. Some I even named. Big Belle, for instance, she fell down the well. It took us five days to get her out. We finally put some breadcrumbs in a basket and lowered it down. Darned if she didn't climb right in that basket. Then there was little Lil Pullet, my favorite. She lived longer than any other bird I had. Everywhere I went, the chicken yard, little Pullet would be right there behind me. Springtime was my favorite time of year because it was the only season we could get baby chicks. When the hens began laying their eggs, I'd mark each one with a lightly penciled number to help keep track of its progress during the three weeks it took to hatch. The numbers were always odd, never even. I had been told never to put an even number under a sitting hen. It was bad luck. And I would cheat on those sitting hens. I'd take a few from the hens that were setting on a large number of eggs and slip them under the hens that weren't. This cut down on the number of bad eggs. I also learned that a hen will continue to sit as long as she has under as long as she has eggs underneath her. So by slipping more eggs under my hens, I was able to keep them setting under for another three weeks. Stretching out that pro process is not natural and it took a toll. So I built a makeshift incubator. It worked. I always hoped to save enough money for an actual incubator like the $18.95 model advertised in the Sears Roebuck catalog. We call that catalog our wish book. I fell asleep many nights dreaming about it the way other children dreamed about bicycles and dollhouses, but I was never able to afford it. Yes? If you love chickens so much, why didn't you become a chicken farmer? Hmm. I suppose there are many reasons. Growing up, what I really wanted to be was a preacher. An uncle gave me a Bible for Christmas when I was four. And yes, I do remember when I was four. I'll never forget my mother reading aloud to me my, the first words in that book. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. By the time I was five, I could read it myself. And one phrase struck me strongly, though I couldn't comprehend its full meaning at the time. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So I just preached to, to just about, so I just preached to my chickens just about every night. Ahem. <clears throat> I would get them all into the hen house and settle them on their roost. They would sit quietly. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. They would bow their heads. They would shake their heads. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But they would never quite say amen. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called children of God. I imagine that they were my congregation. Blessed are they, blessed are they which, blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. And for me, I was a preacher, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So as I took a look at these pages, um, there is something that I do want you to notice, and perhaps you've already noticed, is that these illustrations are in black and white. 
And so when it comes to graphic novels, there are opportunities in which illustrators do use black and white as an opportunity to kind of heighten the uh, visual awareness of both the light and the shadows in the text. And what I think is really interesting about this is that the cover, right, we do see the cover, uh, unfortunately, I guess my, my background, but if you do have a copy of the book, to notice that the cover and the back is in color. And so that there's already this contrast for us as the reader to see the cover on the front and back in color, but yet when we're reading the text, we have these kind of heightened images of the, of the black and white. And so what also struck me about this too is that the book kind of figuratively performs this concept of the black and white dynamic that is so prevalent in this book, right? The black and white racial dynamic is, um, that's occurring in this book. So not only does the black and white heighten the intensity, kind of heighten the, the feeling of what we're seeing and experiencing, it's also playing as a metaphor for the black and white um, dichotomy that is also occurring in the book. And so even in these first couple of pages, there are some themes that I had noticed that was going on. Um, and I'll just call out a few. I noticed that there was a conversation and themes around animal rights, identity, family values, and also this coming of age for Congressman John Lewis. And so as a plant-based eater, um, when I was thinking of that's super interesting that his kind of move towards rights really began with wanting to take care of these animals. I began to see a connection with his understanding of how the body works and why it's important, right? And so he wanted this incubator to kind of help the hens through their process of labor, right? Through their process of fertility. In order to do that well, he felt like he wanted to even work harder to, in order to receive the money for the incubator, so in order to help the hens' bodies work better. And so then he's also using these chickens as an opportunity to perform his desired vocation of being a preacher, right? So the chickens have kind of multiple roles in this piece, um, getting him to understand human rights, animal rights, and kind of also being his first audience for his sermons. And so as he gives the sermons to his um, chickens, we have the opportunity to kind of help uh, understand where his values are beginning, right? Which is in the word of God in the Bible. And we're also privy to his family values in this uh, beginning scene, um, because we understand that the family values is that the chores are divvied up, that the chores are divided up uh, across the family. And he has an opportunity to really have dominion, right? Like it's so interesting that he uses the text like in the beginning, um, that because for him in the beginning, when he's really beginning his kind of coming of age, he has dominion over others. He has dominions over these chickens. And it's in that beginning, it's in for him to not only practice his role as a preacher, understanding the word of God, practicing his sermons, but he's growing over what does it mean to rule? What does it mean to supervise? What does it mean to have dominion? And we see that that is the beginning planting seed of him growing in the kind of responsibility that of course would benefit him later on in life. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at pages 76 through 78 to get just a couple more insights. Seventy-six. I was one of the first volunteers to attend. Yes. It wasn't a very large meeting. I was the only student to go from my little school. There were young people like Diane Nash from Fisk University. Others came from Harry Medical College and Tennessee State. At the time, Jim Larson was a graduate student in the Divinity School at Vanderbilt. He also represented an organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation, better known as FOR, a pacifist group committed to the philosophy and discipline of nonviolence. FOR had also published a popular comic book called Martin Luther King and the Montgomery Story, which explained the basic of passive resistance and nonviolent actions as tools for desegregation. I want to start working with young people and students, high school and college students. Jim talked about the Montgomery bus boycott, 
about war resistance, about nonviolence. He spoke of Gandhi, this little brown man from India, using the way of nonviolence to free an entire nation of people. And how could we apply nonviolence just as Dr. King did in Montgomery, all across America, South and North, to eradicate some of the evils we all faced? The evil of racism, the evil of poverty, the evil of war. Jim Lawson conveyed the urgency of developing our philosophy, our discipline, our understanding. His words liberated me. I thought, this is it. This is the way out. So I wanted to pinpoint these pages because I felt like it was a really important time for us to finally kind of um, grab a foundation of what the philosophies he not, John Lewis not only lived by, but the ones that he kind of grew up in and was also propagating to other communities. So we have this moment on page 78 where we kind of get this opportunity to see his revelation, right? So we have this very dark page. We have the light shining on his face, on his collar. And then we have the very little bit of text um, uh, separated, having um, the black space taking up all the space. Normally when we're thinking of illustration or even design, we often have a lot of white space, but it's really interesting that this time of illumination, right? This time of kind of enlightenment for John Lewis is actually taking place in what seems like a shadow, right? What seems like darkness, what seems like um, is a moment of privacy, a moment of secrecy, also kind of a moment of revelation that often happens with prophets, prophets this moment alone. But what's so beautiful is that the way that the whiteness is etched into it, showing the kind of light on his face, right? We kind of have this, perhaps even this Moses moment, right? When you, when you go up on the mountain, when you get the revelation and you come back down and your face is lightened, it's veiled, it's seen differently, and then thus people will also see you differently. So I feel like even in terms of the illustrations, not just the text, that this moment is really pivotal. And it also comes pretty mid-center of the, of the book as well. So we also kind of know in terms of the story that this is a very um, moment of climax that's really something's going to start to move as we come out of this page. And of course, we know that on 79, things really do um, start to move. I also want to think through um, a little bit more the do's and don'ts of the nonviolent. So right in this, in this couple of pages, we have him kind of professing that this is what he wants to do. And then on page, what page is that? Uh, page 97, we have this list of the um, do's and don'ts of the nonviolent movement. And what I really want to think, this is actually the last part that I'm going to be reading, is that especially when we go in the Q&A, and for those of you who do practice nonviolence um, as a, a preliminary way of moving culture and moving society towards um, equality, that what are some of the ways in which you've experienced these do's and don'ts? Have they changed? Should they have not changed? Like, where is the kind of mindset should we be in in contemporary racial justice work um, in relationship to these, to these do's and don'ts? So I'll go ahead and um, read them. So this is again on page 97. Do not. One. Strike back or curse if abused. Two, laugh out. Three, hold conversations with floor walker. Four, leave your seat until your leader has given you permission to do so. Five, block entrances to stores outside or the aisles inside. Do, one, show yourself friendly and courteous at all times. Two, Sit straight, always face the counter. Three, report all serious incidents to your leader. Four, refer information seekers to your leader in a polite manner. Five, remember the teachings of Jesus, Mahatma Gandhi, and Martin Luther King. Love and nonviolence is the way. 
May God bless each of you. And so as I end that, I actually want to start off by asking Reverend Jim, as someone who is both in the church, someone who also is thinking um, forward of how to move an entire congregation and society forward, I'm wondering if you could perhaps open up this time of reflection and kind of as we move towards our Q&A, if there's anything in the book that was particular for you, important that you would um, like for us to look at and highlight. Sure, thank you, LaShawn, that was beautiful. And thank you so much for opening up really different ways to appreciate everything about the pages. Um, I had a page that really spoke to me just a few pages later after the do's and don'ts about the nonviolent movement. And I was just thinking about how so often people have reacted recently to the Black Lives Matter movement and by describing it as violent sometimes, um, we have a Black Lives Matter banner on our church property. And uh, I've had a neighbor come up to me and say, oh, that's so Marxist of you. Um, and how can you espouse violence because of that? And I'm just thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, I've actually read Marx and I don't even know what you're talking about. And I did not, I could not grasp why she was so upset and why she associated this with violence when it's a movement, when the whole civil rights movement is so deeply embedded in this nonviolence commitment. And I know that it has changed over the years and all that, but still. Um, and uh, this page that spoke to me so much is on page 103. And it's, uh, I, I know I didn't ask anyone to put it up, but 103 is this page here. If you have the book, you can look at it. But it's got three principal panels. And I'll just describe what's in each one in the top, and it's the time that he is arrested for the first time. Uh, he's a divinity student. You know, he was in seminary and ended up being um, excused from the ordination process in the Baptist church because of his activism. Um, and that spoke to me because I've been an activist my whole life, including in seminary. Uh, though fortunately I was not, uh, I was not uh, kicked out of the process uh, for it. Um, and here's how he describes in the top panel. We wanted to change America to make it something different, something better. And then in the panel, you see the police putting white protesters in one paddy wagon and black protesters in another paddy wagon. So they were even seg segregating the protesters, right? And they're just singing, we shall overcome we shall overcome and you see the words and the music we shall overcome uh, as the overlay to them being arrested and put into paddy wagons and as they're being taken away uh, he says there were so many of us to arrest that as they drove us off to jail we filled every paddy wagon the police had in nashville and then you see them singing as they're being carted away in these paddy wagons we shall overcome someday and uh, this takes place outside of a Woolworths. I grew up in a little town in Michigan where we had a Woolworths. Uh, this was in the 60s and 70s. But uh, so after this is depicted, but not that much later. Um, and, and then uh, the date, February 27th. This is the bottom third, 1960. And this is all in darkness. And it's them inside the paddy wagon. So it's the darkness inside the, uh, the vehicle. February 27th, 1960, was my first arrest. And it's kind of a bleak picture because it's at night, it's dark, it's unlit. Um, he describes his first arrest. And then the last part of the panel, um, I don't, you probably can't see it, but I'll put it there at the very bottom. It says, the first of many. And it just struck me that this is a point in his life when he made a choice early on. Uh, and it determined so much about him that he was willing to break rules and get arrested and lose his possibility of being ordained, though it, it certainly didn't prevent him from having a life in public service. Uh, because really, I think being in Congress became his ministry. And it never, he kept getting arrested his whole life, even, even while he was in Congress. 
uh, he uh, uh, organized sit-ins and demonstrations in solidarities with immigrants and people who didn't have health insurance. Um, but this one page had this, this, the spareness of a graphic novel has almost no words, just pictures, but it depicted a pivotal moment in his life. And I think it spoke to me too, because though I've been an activist in a lot of ways and lots of causes from working for the Equal Rights Amendment in the 70s and, and gay rights, lots of gay rights stuff, and then lots of AIDS activism. And uh, I've never been arrested. I've tried several times. I don't know why, I just can't seem to get arrested. Um, and I really have tried. I mean, I gave out medical marijuana for my church in San Francisco in the 90s. Uh, but uh, that has never happened. And um, I admire someone who has really risked this kind of crossing a line for conscience sake. Um, so it really made an impression on me. So that's that's the page I wanted to share. Uh, and I wonder if others, uh, this is why I think he's such a, such a role model for me and, and why I think he's worth lifting up as a role model um, for his faith, for his choices, for his conscience. Um, anyway, that's, that's what came to mind for me. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, Reverend Lori, if you have any additional thoughts, I would love to hear from you as we begin this conversation with all of the others. So feel free to either write in the chat or you can always unmute yourself if you would like to um, speak aloud, or you can also raise your hand with the uh, participation function, and then that way we'll know to call on you. Well, I just want to echo what uh, Reverend Jim said. I mean, th this what what he shared when, when you look at the date um, that um, it was in the panel that he read, February twenty seventh. 1960, he would have only been 20 years old at that time. He would have just turned 20 years old. And to have that type of commitment on the uh, page pages before, um, he said, you know, I'm, I was not afraid. And I, I just think that that really um, spoke to his commitment, spoke to his faith, it spoke to his um, dedication to making a change in what he saw as a very uh, a wrong, the wrong that he saw that he grew up in, that he lived in, and his commitment to making a change. I mean, how many of us at two times, three times that age would be thinking, oh, well, you know, I don't want to ruin my life. I don't want to ruin my future. I don't want to uh, cause waves and some, some, you know, I, that's why that phrase of his good trouble is so, I think, uh, telling and it's important because too many of us, I think, are afraid to stand up for what we know is right because we don't want to make waves. But at 20 years old, he was, he was ready to put it all on the line. Thank you. From the audience, does anyone have any insight or thoughts about um, the text, John Lewis, or perhaps even putting his work in conversation with some of the work that you all are doing in your own communities? Marion? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I really appreciate it, Dr. LaShawn. Um, I, John Lewis has been one of my heroes many, 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 many years. So it's been I mean, I studied SNCC in college and stuff like that. So, you know, I've known who he was forever. And then, um, you know, to lose him and, you know, Congressman Conyers and Elijah Cummings, I think it was like all within a six month period. It was like, to me, such a devastating blow to this. These were huge, big parts of, you know, a lot of the rights that we um, as marginalized communities and really all communities because, you know, when, as they say, when there's injustice anywhere, you know, that's a, you know, injustice everywhere. Um, but I, um, I wasn't able to read the book, but just looking at the imagery and stuff that you guys have shown and I can just, hear, I can like hear his voice, like the, through the stories and it's like, and that one picture, that one imagery, you know, with the, um, 
where you had mentioned, yeah, you know, usually when, they, like in, in a, I read a lot of comic books and graphic novels, if they do the white and the black, you know, the background will be white and the text will be black, right? And if it's vice versa, usually it's to show a dark or shadowy or like a, you know, ominous foreboding. But I didn't get that sense from that image. I got a sense of, of power, of uh, determination, of strength, you know, like, like a, a sense of, I don't know, <laughs> black power. I don't know what other way to say it, but I don't know, just Congressman Lewis, he was a hero and he'll always be a hero to me. I mean, that good trouble. I mean, people like him, people like Che Guevara, people like Malcolm X. I mean, even when it wasn't popular, even when they're putting their own lives on the line. And yes, Malcolm and Che, they definitely did cross points where it was violence. Um, the fact that someone like Congressman Lewis and maybe it had to do with his faith in part, I would say definitely a big part, he still managed to convey this passion and this, um, not just like a, a passion, but also the activism, the action that accompanies the passion to undo um, all these wrongs, you know, not just for him, him and his, you know, his contemporaries or future generations put his body on the line, you know, literally and, you know, figuratively um, and do it in a way that's still respectful and still, I mean, you just don't, people like that don't just come along all the time, you know? I mean, that's why, like I said, I'm still mourning the loss of him, Conyers and Cummings all at once. It's just but this is amazing, you know, that you guys have chosen this book. And I'm actually going to pick up the trilogy. Reverend Jim just told me a fourth volume's coming out. I'm so stoked. It's going to be awesome. So, yeah, thank you. I don't know if that's it. <laughs> thank you. That was great. I really appreciate that. Yes, Diane. You're still muted, Diane. Okay, I chose uh, seven. I, I think you, you muted yourself again, just as you unmuted. <laughs> oh, somebody unmuted me and then I muted myself. Okay, am I, am I okay? Okay, I'll try again. <laughs> All right, so after his first experience, uh, he comes home from the bus and meets with his family. And um, and this is what I'll read the text because I think it, it's another uh, instance of a decision he had to make that was different than what his family was feeling at that time. At first, they wanted to be supportive, but they were afraid, not just for themselves, but for those around us, our friends and neighbors. They said they didn't want anything to do with filing a suit against the state of Alabama, nothing not one thing. I was heartbroken, but it was their decision. I wrote Dr. King a letter explaining that I would be returning to Nashville in the fall. Looking back, it must have been the spirit of history taking hold of my life. And, and I think it's kind of interesting at the bottom of the page, there's a knock, knock. It says knock, knock. But when you turn the page, it's fast forward to him as a congressman meeting people. So there's sort of like, this was a decision he made at this time that he was gonna have to make a decision even though his parents couldn't totally support him at that time. So I, I, I was touched by reading that. I agree. I think it is a really brilliant transition, right? We have this moment where all of a sudden then we're like pulled back into the present with that knock, knock. And he says, come in. And then we have this next generation of, it was it Jacob and Esau, <laughs> brilliant names, uh, really looking up to him and being able to see. So it, it, I mean, the, that kind of transition just flows so well, because we have this moment where he's like, 
I'm going to do this. And then we're pulled into the present. We've known that he already said yes. We've known that he's seen his life. And then we see these next two young men, perhaps the future generation um, moving forward and getting to learn more about him. So thank you, Diane. Does anyone else have any other thoughts that they would like to share? Uh, yes, this is Dick. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, just uh, following up on what Reverend Jim said on on page 102, um, uh, it's John Lewis saying, I was not afraid. I felt free, liberated, like I had crossed over. And uh, for me, that's reminiscent of uh, Martin Luther King's words. And I'm paraphrasing here, but Martin Luther King said, uh, if you don't have something you're willing to die for, you don't have anything to live for. And those words speak to everyone. And uh, it, it, to, to me, this is, this is John Lewis finding what he was he was willing to be in this case be arrested for and and uh, ultimately uh, what he was was willing to die for and he had crossed over his he had it, it, it was he had made a major change in the direction of his life and the and the purpose of his life I definitely agree with you. And I do love the language of like I had crossed over, right? That there's like as if his soul had been pulled out of his body, right? And we also, of course, have that image in terms of um, uh, the parting of the Red Sea, right? The crossing over. There's so many ways in which his understanding of the Bible uh, shows up in the language that gets used in this text. Yes. Philip. It's, uh, I have not read the book, but I should read the book. Uh, I'm really moved by whatever, uh, I'm from India, uh, whatever Gandhi has done, MLK, as well as uh, here, John Lewis, the non-violence matter. That is so powerful. No doubt it's a slow, it takes like, uh, you lose the patience, it takes long time, but it serves two purpose. It, before it achieves the ultimate objective, for example, independence or equality here, before that, it prepares our own people, the suffering people, to be ready for the cause, what is coming. So even it may be painful, slow process, but it just prepares everybody together, and it's a win-win for all, including the host who is discriminating, as well as who is being discriminated both ways. So I'm proud of the steps they are taking. Keep it up. Your good work. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's wonderful. Uh, Alexis, you're next. Good evening, um, Dr. LaShawn. When you talked about him being an animal rights activist, I thought about when I had the great pleasure of meeting him in 2016. And he has all these great accomplishments, but he didn't talk about anything political. He talked about his cats and how his kitty cats had been such a comfort to him when his wife passed away in 2012, how he looked forward to coming home to them every evening, how they would lay across his feet. And I just, I was um, just in awe of him. And I was thinking this great man wants to talk to me about his kitty cat. And he just, um, it just made me think he has just this enormous heart and a love for all living things. And for you to point that out also, that's what I remember most about him too, his, his love of everything living. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Mm -hmm. And then we also have uh, Reverend Jim's cat joining us <laughs> as well this evening. <laughs> Who else would like to speak on the book or your experience of the book or even your experience? Jim, Jim Self? Uh, you're muted, Jim. Yeah. 
Okay. Hi. I thought the book was marvelous. Uh, uh, as a as a youngster, I got I was introduced to books through classic comics. Um, I don't know if anybody remembers those, but uh, they published uh, comic books uh, about the Three Musketeers, King Arthur and the Round Table. And uh, I thought they were so interesting that I quit buying comic books and started going to the library. I think uh, this, uh, this book, this, this format is for these difficult topics uh, and important topics. Uh, the combination of the words and the pictures and the emotions that they evoke are very valuable and a great tool to uh, convey these difficult topics to people in a, in a, in a meaningful uh, way. So I hope that this experience uh, generates more of this. I also am very disappointed that there's so few of us participating in this event and I'm wondering I understand it's being recorded will there be a way that we can direct people to this this um, this meeting so that they can uh, benefit from uh, benefit from it or uh, be inspired by it so uh, I'll take my answer off the air well, I'll answer you first. We are uh, going to be sending it to the liaisons and it will be on our uh, PMC website. So we'll be, our intention is to share it as much as we can. So thank you. Right. And I guess those of us who have participated, if we can reach out to our, our friends and associates to uh, take a look at it, I think it would be, uh, it would be a, a good thing. Yeah, and we still have copies of the book that we're happy to make available for free to people uh, if they like. So contact Diane or contact me. Thank you. I, Lionel? Yes, <clears throat> Lionel, um, it's um, exactly the pages uh, that I, you know, that I focused on, which was uh, the chickens. And uh, his being a preacher at that very young age, and it emphasized the faith, the faith that he had, that no matter where it took him, the right element was going to be involved in his life. And his journey was a journey of small steps but in, in the, con the continuation of the, uh, the goal, the goal of equality. He, and he trusted so much in humanity that if you just stay with it, that the humanity and all of us will come together. So that was the things that uh, came out of that. And I, frankly, I didn't um, look at the pictures and the contrast uh, until you pointed them out and how each emphasized the importance of the different parts of his life. Uh, so the combination is very powerful. Uh, and for me, I'm just beginning this journey. Um, the journey of uh, faith and I will hopefully on August Did we lose him? Okay, I think we lost him. Hopefully he'll be able to come back and, oh, I think we have you back. I just wanted to say, I don't know if you heard me, I didn't think I'd ever be part of a march in my whole life. And on August 15th, I am hoping to be part of our march that's gonna occur in San Mateo. Uh, what a revelation for this small little soul here that if it can be accomplished at age of 76, it can be accomplished for many people. Thank you. 
Thank you for sharing that. And also just kind of bringing back the visual aspect, right? So much of the civil rights and the reason why internationally it became a topic of conversation was because of the images on television, the images um, in the newspaper. So to have a graphic novel, right? He could have just written a novel. He probably could have had a, a, so many people wanting to write his biography, but it, it is interesting to kind of use what, um, helped move the movement forward, which is images, right, of people being brutalized by the police, by other people in their community, which gave us this kind of visual shock, um, is something that's also being replicated in the graphics of this text, which is, again, um, another reason what makes this uh, so powerful as a graphic novel. Yes, Carol. Um, I would just like to say, can you hear me? I would like to say that um, I was uh, invited to visit Diane Farner in uh, California, and um, all of this came about while I was there getting prepared for this, and I will be 80 next year, and I was so proud to have that book under my arm when I got on my plane to come back to Oregon, and I have already um, met with some gals this morning, and our little group from our church and I will be sharing this and uh, what little bit I will be able to do, which I'm sure won't be compared to a lot. Um, I feel like it gives me a little tiny bit of um, being able to part, be part of the march. And, and I'm very, very thankful. Thank you, Carol. I would actually love to um, just go back to a previous question I had, and perhaps Dilip, you will be able to give us some insight into the concept of nonviolence um, that we brought in on uh, page 97, where he kind of lists the do's and do nots of nonviolence. So I'm just wondering if anyone does kind of have a contemporary concept of how to move through nonviolence. Um, perhaps in the same ways that he listed, or if there are additional ways in which the nonviolent movement has grown since, uh, since uh, John Lewis has experienced it. I don't know if I'm answering your question, um, Dr. Daly, but my feeling is I'm praying to instill in the people that are in around me um, the sense of nonviolence because I think I feel like some of us that we've experienced a lack of it, and um, and each of us in the way we conduct ourselves. I think are called to be a model of peaceful um, handling things. And um, uh, I, I just wanna um, thank all of the people that came tonight and, and feel the spirit of all of you. And you know um, we're working hard to stand up and make our community better and stand up with each other but I, I think that's my reaction to your to your question is that I want to I'm kind of called as I've been, you know, studying John Lewis and thinking of him and and Martin Luther King and all the other role models of trying to operate in a more peaceful way. Yeah, that's helpful. A number of us read on. Um on uh, Martin Luther King Day, Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Uh, literally a couple of hundred of us read it together out loud on Zoom, taking turns reading paragraphs. Uh, 30, there were 30 readers, but a couple hundred people all together tuned in. And it was quite a treatise on nonviolence that's, that spoke from a place of integrity. I mean, there was Martin Luther King in jail for just for organizing a boycott uh, and 
in solitary confinement, as a matter of fact. And that was from that, that, that famous summer where there were scenes of uh, fire hoses being turned on children and dogs, uh, attack dogs that were controlled by the police. So the, the talks of nonviolence were not just hypothetical, they were really actually happening. And I thought about this last year in San Mateo County where I've been to protests um, around the death, the first year death anniversary of Chinadua Kobe, uh, who was killed by tasers, by police tasers uh, in uh, Millbrae or Birmingham on, uh, what's the street, the big street? I know you, know all, you all know it, I can't think of it right now. Okay. Uh, El Camino Real, yeah. And we were there at the site a year later and it was a non-violent protest. Uh, and then last fall when we had the vigil at the Island Church called Pray Their Names where people gathered uh, socially distanced masked uh, to commemorate people whose lives had been lost to um, police brutality, black people, uh, 150 names on little crosses. Uh, it also was nonviolent, but very powerful. Um, and then there is a page in here on page 100 where John Lewis talks about how they, when they were at the lunch counters, violence does beget violence, he says on the bottom of page 100. But the opposite is just as true. And then at the top of 101, Fury spends itself pretty quickly when there's no fury facing it. And uh, he talks about how the beating subsided, the groups at Kresge's faced humiliation. And he just shows pictures of, of them sort of receiving the violence, but eventually they wear themselves out. Now I'm not trying to romanticize it by any stretch. I know it was horrible to endure, but there is power in it also. And that's, that's what I, I aspire to, manifesting that kind of power. And they use their bodies too. Their actual, this wasn't just like writing a letter to the editor or something that's powerful, but, or a sermon, you know, they used their bodies to convey a message of nonviolence. And I know it made an impression. It changed lives, it changed history, so. I aspire to that. Mm. Thank you, Reverend Jen. Yeah, you make a really good point about nonviolence being a very embodied practice and a very embodied performance. Um, so we do have a couple of hands. So I see Anita. We'll go. Rev uh, we'll go Anita, Reverend Lori, and then Marion. Um, I just want to briefly um, bring our discussion tonight to things that are happening um, uh, elsewhere. Um, and when I read this book, I just can't help but think about um, my people in Hong Kong who has been fighting um, for their freedom of expression in the last two years. Um, Martin Luther King um, and uh, Gandhi, and maybe people in Hong Kong do not know that enough about John Lewis, but, but nonviolence resistance has an enormous following in, in Hong Kong. It was brought up again and again in the discussion. And, and I believe many of you remember images of hundreds of thousands of people um, in the big boulevard and all, traffic couldn't go through. And then the people suddenly just open up like water to allow a, an ambulance to go through. Um, and that that is the power of, uh, of, of peaceful, demonstration and peaceful um, resistance. I, I just wanted to, uh, I was thinking of an analogy um, from back in my younger years when I used to play tennis. And when I used to play um, men in particular who were stronger than I was, uh, one of the things that I learned to master was uh, a drop shot or one of those little dinks because they would hit so hard and I, I couldn't match their strength, but I could win a whole lot of points by just taking the power away, uh, by just dinking it over. 
And I think to some degree, and I'm not trying to say that nonviolence is, you know, something dinky or like a drop shot, but it takes the power of the violence away. Uh, because one of the things we see, you know, and I'm thinking about this when Reverend Jim uh, mentioned, uh, you know, writing uh, op-eds or whatever. I know that when I write one on behalf of the uh, NAACP for uh, the, the the Daily Journal, I wanted to, there's, there's this group of people that always comment, no matter what I said, no matter how non-threatening what I said was. And it's always, you know, you and NAACP and the Black Lives Matter and all of the violence. And first of all, um, Black Lives Matter, a lot of the people that have uh, committed violent acts uh, were not from Black Lives Matter. But what I've noticed is that every time someone writes something in support of rights, the rights of the marginalized, the rights of uh, the, the oppressed, the, the rights of people who have been disenfranchised, um, these people will always, without fail, bring up all, well, what about the violence in Black Lives Matter? What about the violence in Black Lives Matter? What about the violence of all the Blacks that kill Blacks? And, and so one of the things that when you are reacting in nonviolence, you take away what they're trying to do, you know, and, and, and you, you take they, the, the images of children during, during the civil rights era of children being water hosed, um, it, it, instead of having um, you know people coming at them with uh, guns and, and all of that, which would only play to that violence begets violence, the image of water hoses on children and dogs biting people who are unarmed, who are just protesting, um, it, it is powerful because it appeals to the sense of decency in Americans when they see this. You know, even people who are like, you know, apathetic have to say there's something wrong here. When people are nonviolent, there's just sitting at a counter, they're just walking down the street and they're being attacked, they're being spat upon. They're, you know, the image of, of Ruby Bridges walking into school, a little girl having to be escorted and all of the viciousness and the vitriol. It appeals to the decency of people. And that's why it, nonviolence is so important. You know, not only for those of us that practice uh, Christianity and, and, and the teachings of Jesus, um, and, and that's a big basis, but just it takes the power away from those who are evil when we practice nonviolence. And it, it's hard because I, I say as a preacher, there are times when people have called me to N word and my, my, the person inside of me just wanted to cuss them out. But <laughs> by you know, maintaining dignity, you take away their power. Thank you so much. Mariam? I just want to thank you, um, Dr. Owens, for that. I mean, that was, yeah. I mean, you were 100% right that, uh-oh, am I still here? OK. <laughs> um, you know, as far as when you use that tool of nonviolence, which is something that, you know, SNCC picked up on, that MLK picked up on, that, you know, obviously John Lewis picked up on, that you really do kind of take away that whataboutism, that, 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 that argument against, you know, your cause, your movement, you know, against uh, whichever, you know, injustice at that time that you're fighting against. Um, with that being said, I also want to highlight that Nonviolence was a big part of what John Lewis stood for, but he also, you know, it, as we can see, you know, through all his accomplishments, it went hand in hand with, um, with like a uh, tangible results, right? And it wasn't just like, oh, because the country was ready for it and LBJ did this or this or that, like, no, like he spent his whole lifetime putting his money where, you know, where his mouth is, you know, he put in his body where, um, where his mouth is, or, you know what I mean? And I think that 
nonviolence is important and it's key and it, you know all of those you know various do's and don'ts that you know you mentioned while I mean the count we may not be sitting at counters anymore thanks to people like rest in peace congressman lewis um but at the same time we have to remember that we can't let that the 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 concept of nonviolence um you know civil will be a good trouble cannot be uh the good that can't be separated away from the need to be you know also be proactive you know and in this case let's say voting rights stuff like that i mean that stuff is super important as you know that's the two go hand in hand like you know you we have to remember that when we are doing this nonviolence civil disobedience these sort of things that there's a cause for it. We're not just doing it for the sake of being really nice people or to emulate how Jesus would, you know, say, turn the other cheek or whatever. I mean, there, 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 need, there is a reason for it. And at that time, I mean, it was for the lives of the black people in America. I mean, you know, voting rights and all of the other rights too, but their actual lives and I think that we are headed, I mean, we're in that similar situation. So nonviolence, yes, but let's not forget that the activism has to be, they have to work in tandem, you know, to get the results. So. Yes, thank you, Mary. I think you bring up a couple of really great insights. And one of them in particular is that to be nonviolence is not to not act, right? To be nonviolent is an action, it's a move forward, it's an embodied force, like Jim was saying earlier. So it is really interesting to think of nonviolence as an opportunity to enact what perhaps the inside wants to do, right, which is to rage and to get angry, um, as Reverend Laurie was mentioning, but, right, it's the calming of that so that your actual performance, your actual body, remains still, but we also know that stillness is never completely still, right? Our heart is still moving, our lungs are still taking in breath. So it's not this um, real stillness, but a kind of stillness of the mind and of the soul, uh, but that is still in action, right? There's still movement there. There's still the, the flowing of the blood in our bodies in order to um, enact nonviolence. And then the other thing you said, which I thought was really interesting that, uh, because we're not no we're not necessarily sitting at counters, but there's so many figurative counters <laughs> that we're standing at, that we're sitting at, that we're like trying to purchase food at. And it is really interesting to think um, that perhaps because we don't see the counters anymore, the our inability to um, see them and see the forcing of not being able to eat there, or not being able to sit there, but to also recognize oh that there's so many figurative counters out there that we have to sit at and that we have to breathe oh. at and that we have to stand All right. at. Yeah, even like stuff like redlining, which is, you know, mm -hmm. invisible, you know, you don't actually see the lines, but we know it's there and we know how the neighborhoods are. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't want, you know, so I just want to clarify, I didn't mean that like the figurative counters, yes, 100% right, yeah, agree yeah, with you. Yeah, yeah okay, great. Yeah. So, and okay, I think great. you're making a really great point. I was just, I was just thinking that too. I think it's one of those things where um, it really is important to acknowledge that the counters still exist and um, that we, in terms of the nonviolence, like you were saying earlier, uh, that there has to be strategy around these kind of figurative and imaginary counters since it's no longer just the sitting and the taking on the violence in that particular way. No, I thought that was really great insight. Um, so I know that our time is coming to a close and I just want to thank you all for being a part of this conversation and I would love for Reverend Jim if you have any additional insights that you would like for us to take away as we close for tonight. Well, first of all, can we appreciate uh, first Reverend Lori for uh, being here tonight and for her participation and I want to remind people that everyone who cares about racial equality and matters of equity in San Mateo County is welcome to become a member of the uh, San Mateo branch of the NAACP. She didn't ask me to say this. This is just my own personal pitch as a member of the NAACP. Uh, so uh, go to the NAACP website if you care about these issues and consider becoming a, a paid member. Um, and then can we appreciate uh, Dr. LaShawn Daly for uh, her leadership tonight in every way, 
literary, uh, cultural, political, all of it was brilliant. And so I, I could see why students and why you're a teacher of teachers uh, and why students flock to you. So, and why my colleagues at the Jewish Community Library uh, waxed on about you. So uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I will, I put this in the chat, but I commend to you, if you're interested in just the march as a marching as a phenomena, uh, check out as your Independence Day weekend activity, uh, watch the movie Selma. Uh, it's not about John Lewis per se, but John Lewis played a principal role in the march in Selma that took place a couple of years after what this book is leading up to. So um, uh, check it out, it's on Amazon Prime and available in other ways. Uh, so uh, it'll further whet your interest for our movie night at the LDS Church in Foster City on July 24th. Let's have 100 people there. It'll be fun. We haven't had a gathering of the multi-faith coalition yet. I mean, since post-COVID or sort of post-COVID, we, wherever we're at right now, uh, coming out of COVID. So let's plan it. Get there at 7.30 and let's chat with each other uh, and hang out together. And as soon as it's sunset, we're going to watch the movie. And uh, it's a great documentary. You can also watch it on your own. Uh, it too is available on Amazon, but uh, come watch it as a group. It'll be fun. Uh, and uh, everything's up to date in Foster City. Just come and see. Uh, and if you've never been off the mainland onto the island, it's not that far. You can do it. Uh, and I loved hearing Lionel talk about uh, how he's going to make his first march, the one on August 15th. Let's talk this up in our faith houses. We can have 100 people there. And 100 people is a lot of people, uh, or maybe even more. So let's, uh, let's start talking it up now. August 15th, March for Racial Justice in San Mateo County in downtown San Mateo at Central Park. So those are, those are my announcements. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Sue and Dana, our staff at Multi-Faith Coalition. And thank you, Diane Farmer, who really uh, made this happen. Uh, so uh, let's just uh, keep working and make good trouble. Let's make this a summer of good trouble together. All right? Exactly. Good, good to see night you all. all. Good Thank night. You, everyone. See you in July. Yep. Thank you. Bye, Lionel. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, Carol. Good Thank to see you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. LaShawn. You were awesome, man. Thank I'm out to I told Jim, I was like, oh, I was like, should I get the Kindle or reading the whole trilogy? So I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to go buy the whole, I'm going to have the whole set, you know, mm -hmm. just like in honor of him because. Mm -hmm. You'll love I'm gonna it. cry. I mean, I can't wait. I'm mean, very excited, and it's so beautiful. And I, I'm a comic books nerd, but now a politics nerd, uh, so, uh, social justice nerd. I mean, this is just like my wheelhouse on all levels, you know. And then mm -hmm. you talking about environmental stuff. I was like, uh oh, my ears perked up with the animal rights, and I was like, oh, it's done. So I'm very excited. Awesome. But thanks again for the offer, Jim, and thank you guys for everything, putting it together. I, I'm really I'm grateful to be a part of it. So thank you guys and God bless you all and um, have a wonderful weekend. Week, we I know rest your week and weekend. Okay. We'll see you Sunday. Yes, this Sunday you will. My grandmother told her, I was like, I am done. No more. I have to go back to my life. <laughs> you have six kids and ten other grandkids that they can help you too. <laughs> okay. Sorry, you. Diane. That's a, my my. <laughs> It looks like Catherine's still on here. Yeah, Catherine, we're just going to touch base with LaShawn for a little bit to take care of some housekeeping stuff. So thanks for being here tonight. <laughs> Maybe she's away from her computer. She might. What do I do? Let's see. Um, uh, let's see. Remove? Should I remove her? Yeah, because she might might be stepped away from her phone or something. 
Okay. There we go. Oh, All no. right. Don't, don't report. <laughs> we won't report her. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you, LaShawn. That was fantastic, I thought. I don't know what you all think, but I think we get an A. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop the recording. Hmm.